What's up, party people, and welcome back to another episode of NYC Foodways, your weekly food and culture discussion from the cultural capital of the world. My name is John, and this week's episode is dedicated to the life and legacy of Spanish revolutionary Buenaventura Duruti, who carried the future in his heart. Is it possible to assign authorship to a cultural product held in the commons? In 1962, American film critic Andrew Saris published the essay Notes on the Auteur Theory, Influenced by the French film critics writing in the journal Cahier du Cinéma, most notably François Truffaut, Saris came up with the then novel idea of auteur theory, which postulates that the distinguishable personality of the director of a movie is a criterion of value. That is, what an artist or author carries within them should be considered when reviewing their works. Essentially, our understanding of a piece of cultural production, say a food-related YouTube clip, has the potential to be enhanced by our knowledge of what went into its production or the real life of the auteur or author behind it. If we knew, for the sake of this discussion, of the deep well of pain that had to be overcome before a certain author was ready to bring his creative food and culture vision to life, we might have greater feelings of attachment to the work he produces, hypothetically speaking. Unlike a piece of art with an obvious author, however, Foodways themselves are the overdetermined end result of the contributions of thousands of generations of people, a collective, synchronous, anonymous authorship of something free to use, free to give away, and free to reproduce. To take it one step further, I believe that the restaurants of New York City, especially long-standing, traditional, or first-generation restaurants, have a powerful collective cultural authorship behind them as well. As the city of immigrants in a relatively young nation of immigrants, New York City is the most diverse food city in the world. This city's foodways are so beautiful because they formed in the pressure cooker of friendly immigration policies, tight quarters, and intense economic needs. Even the New York City Steakhouse, that most American of American foodways, is a direct descendant of the 17th century London Chop House, a fact that one would be hard pressed to find on Yelp.com, that vast online repository of poorly researched and poorly written reviews, where a very different, very dissonant, very asynchronous type of authorship is on display. Citizens of Yelp World rarely acknowledge the importance of a restaurant to its particular neighborhood or any sort of history behind the place, its owners, or the role it plays in continuing or departing from a long established aspect of New York City's food culture. Instead, I found that a large number of Yelpers feel the need to author diatribes of what they perceive to be the service of a particular place. Donning a cape once more for Tasty Dumpling, I will share this gem with you. The customer service sucks. The lady in the front is so rude to customers like, if you don't like working with customer service, you shouldn't work at all. So here's what I'm thinking. After the millions of loyal NYC Foodway subscribers successfully rise up in mass against the Yelp behemoth, we offer them the following deal. <clears throat> we will allow Yelp to continue to operate under the condition that, in order for a member of the Yelp Brain Trust to post a review of a restaurant, the restaurant will likewise be allowed to post a review of the diner. The following questions will be considered when restaurants are reviewing your basic ass. Were you on time for your reservation? Did you and your group keep your voices to a normal conversational level? Did you make any outlandish attempts at menu adjustments or substitutions? Did you complain about the food, even though it was plainly described on the menu, cooked perfectly, and served on time? Do you frequently have issues when going out to eat? Did you eat a fraction of your food, knowing full well that the remainder is headed to the landfill? Did you use some sort of obscure coupon situation that your server had never seen before, thus dooming their shift? Did you stay past closing, despite the fact that your table was the only one occupied, thereby keeping the entire staff from getting home? Did you tip less than 15% like the rich cheapskate you are? Is your three-star view of the world a mirror image of the three-star manner with which you interact with it? And here's why I probably should pause to pay grudging respect to our good friends at the New York Times. As discussed before, food writing and analysis is largely the realm of dwellers of the ivory tower. That said, like heart surgery and stand-up comedy, some things really are best left to the professionals, and the New York Times well-compensated and highly visible food writers are absolutely professional in their conduct. Their restaurant reviews are on point, their discussions of little-known and insufficiently loved local food businesses are somewhat infrequent but certainly commendable, their recipes are worth giving a shot, and the beats hit to cover the seasonal foods and foodways of Thanksgiving, Nauru's, Passover, and Christmas do much to record what we at NYC Foodways hold dear. I want to give a quick shout out to the following authors who got me started in this line of work. 
Melissa Clark, Eric Asimov, Florence Fabricant, Mark Bittman, Julia Moskin, Pete Wells, Lagai Mashan, and Peter Meehan, whose writing certainly should be considered, for better or for worse, in light of his personal conduct. That's the point of auteur theory. In addition to shining a light on some of the best parts of our fair city's food culture, the Times Dining section has provided a not insignificant amount of comedy in recent years, a refreshing area of levity in the typically staid pages of The Grey Lady. These hilarious writings are the perfect foil to the dissonant crowd of whiny bloviators on Yelp, and in reading them, the distinguishable personality of the director, as it were, absolutely is a criterion of its value. The following reviews are side-splitting and really do make the reader want to have dinner with whoever wrote them. Pete Wells' takedown of Guy Fieri's Guy's American Kitchen and Bar, Frank Bruni's action-packed dinner at Ninja, which, in simulated reality news, features the word Yelp in its title, Pete Wells' wild ride through Senior Frogs in Times Square, Frank Bruni's shellacking of Kobe Club, Sam Sifton's highly amusing bro take on Lavo, Frank Bruni's scorched earth coverage of Ago, and the double whammy of Frank Bruni and Alex Kaczynski's coverage of Harry Cipriani. Yelp could never. Reading these writers work over the course of years, like enjoying the works of any single author over an extended period of time, gives one the sort of metaphysical closeness prescribed by auteur theory, which to me is as much a theory as the theory of gravity. Thus concludes this note from the author. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week for another episode of NYC Foodways. Peace.